Now, as you take a seat, I want you to talk to the people around you. For a moment, I want you to tell them what steals your peace. What's something that takes away peace and tranquility in your life? What's stealing that away? You have to talk to the person next to you. What steals your peace? Okay, I'm sure you've now started talking about dinner, so we'll keep moving. <laughs> Bill Hybels tells us this uh, um, in his book, uh, Simplify. He says, perhaps you've experienced one of these common peace busters, is what he calls them. Um, he says, financial pressure, right? Uh, what are we coming up with for Christmas? What can we really do? Relational breakdown. So things are just not going well with uh, relationships. Um, unexpected bad news. Um, I, I, Sherry, like the news she got um, recently, yeah, my antenna's falling off, sorry, and that's why we're breaking up. We'll see if we can fix it. We're not. Um, so those, those messages uh, can be disheartening and frustrating. A moral failure uh, or impending mortality, realizing our life is short. He says, or maybe uh, you're smack in the middle of one of those right now. When a peace buster comes crashing into your life, what do you do? What do you do when that happens? How do you respond when things are not going the way you wanted them to, the way you thought they should? It happens all the time. For me, I think a big one is stress. Just, just getting worked up, particularly about work, right? Like, like what are we going to do with this? How do we handle this deal? What, what should we be doing to help this issue and, and moving things along? And suddenly there's, there's this way, right? Um, show, show them the picture. Maybe it's just fear. So I got Alyssa, a great picture of Alyssa. Uh, there we go. There's just that, that look in her face. This is not, I'm actually holding her right there, right? And she's like looking at, I don't know, we're in our house at somebody else, but she looks kind of terrified, doesn't she? And, and what happens is, is that's a big part of what steals our peace is this fear of, of maybe finances, right, of potential scarcity. Uh, one of the other pastors in the area I was talking with started talking about this um, philosophy or theology of scarcity, that we can tend to live in this, this mindset that there's not going to be enough, Right? that we're not going to have enough and that we won't make it. And so we, we live with a mindset of scarcity. That was profound to me because it's, I've bought into that at times. Very much so, right? Well, there's, what if this would happen or that would happen? There, there might not be enough. Well, that, that's not very biblical, right? Um, but, but it becomes a fear that we kind of own, or a fear of, of isolation, of being alone, uh, not having relationships, that, that somehow your relationships are going to fall apart um, if they're not already, right? Um, that, that you'll be alone, and so we do whatever we can to keep those relationships even when they're uh, not going well. Or the potential pain, right? Fear of potential pain is a great one, like going to the dentist. Anybody? I don't know what it is, but you just start driving there, and you just, yeah. Ah, there's just this lack of peace for some reason. I don't know. They need prayer warriors surrounding the building maybe when I go or something. Or maybe when you get your blood drawn, something like that, right? Just, just you know, it's not going to be bad. But the peace dissipates so easily. Um, I, there's, there's so many different things. I think yesterday for me, watching some basketball, peace just goes out the window, right? Totally out the window, especially when you think there's something unfair, right? Injustice of any kind, right? Peace. No, we get anxious and frustrated, angry, and, and our emotions go all over the map. Well, um, 
I, I want to challenge you to think beyond just our emotions with regard to this. That maybe there's a part of this or a big part of this that's spiritual. Um, and that this is really Satan's, Satan's deep desire for us is to wreak havoc with our emotions and to, to be frustrated with life, to have anxiety, worry, and fear. To walk in that way, right? That, that's, that's where Satan wants us. We're going to look at an umbrella of how he works. And, and he wants us under this umbrella of darkness and the shadow that, that leads to death. He wants us over here. And the question is, is <laughs> what do you do when you're lacking peace? When you're struggling with that? So we're going to look at Luke chapter 1. You can open your Bible if you'd like. It's right at the very beginning of Luke is where we're at. So the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Um, not too tough to find, but Luke starts off, he's writing to his uh, buddy Theophilus, we assume. Uh, don't really know much about that deal, but he's trying to give a clear picture of the gospel. He wants people to know about Jesus and what happened and it's fascinating to me that there's a little introduction and then he starts with Zechariah and Elizabeth he doesn't start with Mary he starts with Zechariah and Elizabeth an old couple um, so in the Bible I'm not being judgmental or anything along those lines uh, they're they're very old well along in years they have to be 80 90 or something and they have no children they are discouraged frustrated with that i am certain and they're not sure what's really going on with their lives in that sense zachariah is a priest so you know you can assume there's some faith at work in this man some some sense of understanding god's work as a priest and he's actually still at this old age still going to the temple and serving and that's where we find him uh, in the passage he's at the temple He's, he's serving in the Holy of Holies. If you remember any sermons on the, the Holy of this is this is the spot where, you know, you don't go in there just on a regular basis. This is a big deal for even a priest to go into the Holy of Holies at the temple and to offer sacrifices to God. And he's in there offering sacrifices and an angel shows up. This angel has a message for him. And tells him he's going to have a son, and he's supposed to name him John, and that he's going to be a prophet talking about the kind of a, the Messiah. And, and, and Zechariah's like, mm, yeah, I don't think that's good. You're crazy. Okay, this is an angel. I love Gabriel's response. Gabriel responds to, to him with, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right, I forgot that part, right? I mean, you're in the Holy of Holies. This, is, this isn't the angel that we, we tend to put in our minds either of this, you know, the white gown and some big wings and this pretty face and a little halo kind of thing. When we look at angels in Scripture, it's, it's a warrior. It's someone of power and strength that, that's incredibly intimidating and people fall on their face when they encounter angels and Zechariah is going, huh? Well, I don't, I, no, I don't think so. Gabriel's like, you don't have any idea what you're doing. So he tells him, you're not going to be able to speak. And so um, we know later on as well that people have to make gestures to Zechariah. So um, we're assuming then that, that he couldn't hear as well. Uh, and so he couldn't speak, couldn't hear for a time before he then went back to Elizabeth, to his home, which is just south of where I've got the big thing, temple at Jerusalem. That little circle of hill country is where um, uh, Zechariah lived and where John was born. So he goes back. So for at least nine months then, he is with Elizabeth and he can't speak or hear. That's, that's darkness. And, and this is what he's experiencing um, as he's trying to understand what God's doing through all of this. So then in verse 67, we've got uh, the, the, the passage where we're going to actually pick up. 
John is born. He's come to, into this world, and there's been this deal about naming him, right, in the, in the home. Um, everybody wants him to name the baby Zechariah, and, and Elizabeth says, no, no, it's going to be John. And then they ask Zechariah, and so Zechariah writes on a tablet, John is his name, right? And they're all surprised and so forth because you should name him after yourself. I should have named Ian Kevin, but I think that'd be really confusing, so we didn't. Uh, so in any case, you've got this kind of thing going on. And now Zechariah can speak. Suddenly he can speak, and so he does. It says, then his father, John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit that doesn't happen a whole lot in the Old Testament, which is what this is, the time period at least, and gave this prophecy. He spoke these words that are kind of words of praise, but they're speaking about the future. Only two of the verses from this passage speak about John. Most of it speaks about uh, the Messiah that was to come. And we're just going to look at the last two verses from it. Um, there's a lot more we could dig into, and maybe, maybe sometime down the road, maybe next week. I'll surprise you. Verse uh, 78 says, Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Did you catch all of There's so much there. To give light to those who sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, and to guide us to this path of peace. Lord, help us figure this out, and that we wouldn't be caught um, in, a, in a life that doesn't match with what you want for us, but that we would live a life of peace and joy and hope. I pray that you'd speak to us, teach us, and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we look at this passage, there's great stuff in here. Zechariah, uh, uh, if I'm going to break it down, I, there were three Ps, and they worked well. So we're, we're using three Ps that, that talk about peace and get us in that direction that uh, this passage talks about. The first one is the problem. There's, there's this problem that he really addresses, and he nails it really, really well. To those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. I need to... Need a little bigger umbrella, maybe. I don't know. Or not such bright lights. I don't know. They, they sit in darkness, right? So clearly, it's, it's talking about people who have no connection with Christ. There's, there's uh, unbelievers, those, those who don't trust in Christ, right? They, they, they sit in darkness is what he's talking about. Those who have no understanding of what God is doing. They sit in darkness. In the shadow of death. And it's maybe hard for us to even grasp the significance of what it's talking about. To be completely without Christ, without hope, without any sense of peace. Because I think most of us have been raised in an environment where there's lots of people not walking under this umbrella. There's a lot of people that are walking in light. And even their light's shining into our lives if we get caught up in some darkness we, we're, we're spoiled we, we live in a culture where there there's more light than we realize um, we can often look at america and be very frustrated with things for good reason right but at the same time here in alto we're very very blessed god is working and we we see him working but the problem that he's addressing isn't just about those who are without Christ. It's for all of us, I think. Uh, as we look at uh, different passages throughout Scripture, we know that it doesn't just simply, the darkness doesn't just simply completely go away when we trust in Christ. So, so, something keeps going wrong with us. And so we... We, we accept Christ out of desperation at some point, maybe, and, and truly put our trust in, in Him, and, and we're, we're learning the Bible, and we're growing, but then something happens, 
in our lives and, and we start to worry about money or uh, a relationship. And so we, we suddenly kind of find ourselves with just, just our foot under the, the umbrella a little bit, right? Just, just a little bit, a, a little bit of worry. It's not a lot, right? It's not really that big of a deal. I, I'm still doing okay, but it's so easily just kind of keeps pulling us under, uh, at least for me, right? And Satan just kind of keeps using different things in our life to keep pulling us into darkness, even when we trust in Christ. And it's, how do we deal with that, right? Well, most of us, um, ha we have two options. We, uh, well, we have more than two, but at least two when it comes to this. And I think one is for us to just go, yep, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, and and... I'm going to sit under my umbrella of darkness in despair and frustration. Um, and we, we, we sit alone and we get frustrated and discouraged and talk to ourselves um, and, and really just feed on that place of discouragement. And... and, and and that's, that's, that's not a good place. We, we've been there, all of us. Um, but at the same time, there's another option when we're under this umbrella. And that's to really get busy. And to do a lot of things so that we don't even realize we're under the umbrella anymore. Because I'm so busy with my Facebook chatting and whatever else I can find. Um, I need to check my calendar and I need to uh, take care of uh, some emails and then I gotta go pick up the kids. And uh, anybody else with me there, right? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm good, I'm all fine, I have great peace, but I'm just a little frazzled because I have some things to get done, right? And we sit here and we don't, don't really even acknowledge what's going on. But Satan's just having a heyday with this. Going, that's exactly where I want him. And that's, that's our problem. We, we, we go to church and we're good, but no, we're actually probably sitting under this umbrella. Discouraged, frustrated, but we just stay too busy to even fret over it. So into that, the second P the, is a promise. <laughs> Can we get out from underneath that? How do we deal with this? Zechariah says, the morning light from heaven, the sunrise, I watched it somewhat this morning, and man, it comes, once it gets over that hill behind our house, which takes quite a while, um, once it pops over that thing, though, the light just shines in our back windows, and it's bright, it's, it's brighter than the stained glass here, it's, you can't, you can't look, and you, it's, it's hard to read anything when you're sitting there with it shining even at your back. It's, it's blinding. That's the sunrise it's talking about. The promise is this morning light from heaven is about to break on us. It's about to come and shine, to, to give light, to, to shine on us, to, to, to give us light to be able to see and to guide us. There's something huge that's going to happen with, this, with the folks sitting in darkness, is what he's saying. It's going to change everything. And you will not have to stay there any longer. I talked with a, a lady yesterday. Stephanie introduced me to her. And so finding out I'm a pastor, she says, Oh, I have a great story illustration for you for tomorrow or something. And I said, Great, <laughs> right? I'm sure you have something that's going to be just fit perfectly in my sarcasm and probably darkness, right? Um, and, and she goes, this is a, this is a really interesting thing that, that goes on with the Advent candle. Because if you notice with the Advent candles, um, you, you light one each week. And so you, the whole point is that there's more and more light over this Advent time. The, the Advent is, is coming. Jesus is, is coming. And so there's more and more light coming. And as well, the piece that's kind of fun is that the days are getting shorter. Darkness is getting longer um, over this time in December as well for us. So our culture is getting darker and darker, but the light is shining brighter 
and brighter. It's a great illustration. I said, ah, that'll work. It fits perfectly with this. The light is getting brighter. But we still end up finding ourselves dealing with this darkness. David understood this. Psalm 23 said, uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. Micah understood this. The prophet, he says, though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Um, Isaiah understood it. Matthew quotes him saying, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death Upon them, light has dawned. That's the promise of this light coming to shine on us and to give us direction. Particularly to get us to the third P that we would get on this path of peace. This is a great picture for us. That we get to get onto a path of peace or a path to peace. I'm not sure which is best to look at it. Um, used different ways throughout scripture but the path we know is jesus john 3 16 is is, well john 3 16 john 14 6 is a great one i am the way the truth and the life right you get on me i'm the way i am that road i am the path is what that word means so we need to get on the path but the spirit is peace So when we look at Scripture there, um, John 14 as well talks about the Spirit. In verse 17, he says, You know Him, the Spirit, he's been talking about, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. And he goes on in verse 27. I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Don't be troubled or afraid because I'm giving you a spirit that is peace. And Jesus is the path to that peace. So what do we do with it? Do we walk in that or not? Zechariah understood this, I think. He, he had lived many, many years uh, with this darkness looming, right? This, I don't have a son kind of thing. Zechariah was living in this dark place at some level while probably having faith, right? Struggling back and forth between this. And, and then this angel comes and says, oh, I'm going to make it all better. Uh, and he doesn't believe. And so now he has to sit for, for nine months in darkness. Nine months of sitting silent. Now, he didn't have his cell phone. He could just text messages to everybody and, and communicate. He could write on a tablet, sure. But this would have been terribly dark and difficult to communicate to hear what was going on. And I think that darkness was a darkness God kind of nudged him into, right? That you would sit in this place of silence so that you'd hear from God. So that he would draw closer and try to figure out this path. And ultimately, he does. He He comes to a place where he's able to write on that tablet, John is his name. I believe what Gabriel was saying. Um, And and the Messiah is coming. And so he professes this whole passage. And what struck me as well from this is that that first verse that I read, verse 67, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was, after he he made that writing, he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and, and peace and hope and joy. And he's now not under this umbrella, stepping on to a path of peace. And this is what Jesus longs for us. In Luke 19, um, he comes into the city. This is the triumphal injury, Palm Sunday, right? And, there, and he stands and looks over the city and he weeps over the city. And he says these words. He says, how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. 
How I wish all of you would understand this. That I am the way to peace. To joy. Not, not speaking so much nationally and, and wars and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about a real peace for your soul, for your life that you can walk in. That I come as the Messiah and I bring the Holy Spirit. So, where, where are you? It's maybe the first question. I should make you talk to your neighbor. You got one foot under. You got two feet under, leaning out. You full in underneath the, the dark tent over here. Are you, are you walking in light completely? The application for today is really simple. To walk in the light on the path to peace. That's the application. That's the point of what we're talking about. Jesus said in John 14, 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. That's our first step onto that path, is to simply say, I trust. But it seems to me, we say that, I trust you today, <laughs> right? or for the, this moment, but just that quickly, we, we take two steps back. Because now all of a sudden I'm worried about other things that are going on in my life. And, and what am I going to do about these things? What am I going to do with my son or my, my daughter or my parents or whatever? My finances. So oh, I trust you, Jesus, but then just that quickly, we're back over here, right? And so when I ask, do, I, do you trust? You can make a choice right now. I trust. But by noon, when the Packers are losing, <laughs> well, okay, 12.05, right? <laughs> 12, 12.20 um, when they're losing. We, we get frustrated and angry, and, well, why don't they find another quarterback or whatever? Okay. Can we just trust Jesus with whatever God's trying to do with the Packers and, and pray that God would work through these guys and that we wouldn't get so worked up about it, maybe? Wouldn't that be a good thing? But we do. We, this is our battle. So it's a battle of continually saying, I trust you, Jesus. I trust you with whatever. I keep trusting. And that's what takes us to the second part of this, is following the leading of the Holy Spirit. This just challenges me. Verse 25, uh, chapter 5 of Galatians. Paul writes to us, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Did you get that? Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every single part of your life. That the Spirit tells us, guides us, leads us. We are so good at picking up the Bible. And, and I, I read my Bible today, and um, now i got to go to work. <laughs> And, and what's challenging me at this point in life um, is this, this kind of verse. What, well, how do we keep walking in the Spirit and that we can stay away from this altogether? Right? That we are continually letting the Spirit lead us. That's a growing edge for, I think, all of the Reformed churches, right? It's just an area that we've wrestled with, with what do we do with this Spirit thing? Um, and as I ponder this, I, I, you know, when I talk to an Arminian, so somebody who doesn't believe in predestination, my, my thoughts always go to, well, well, then what do you do with the verses in Ephesians that just point blank say, you know, we're predestined. God chose you. Well, what do you do with those, right? Can't argue with that because it just says it. Well, then you look at these passages for us and say, it says, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Well, what does that look like? Um, and and are, have we bought into a very head-oriented faith that is all about having the right knowledge and saying the right things instead of walking in the Spirit on the path to peace? That's the challenge that lies before us. So as you walk into this Christmas season and things get busier and busier and the darkness gets longer and darker and grayer, what are you going to do to walk in a path of peace so that you're 
not having to deal with this, but rejoicing in what God's doing. That's the challenge, and I want to challenge you to take some time this week to be alone and to hear the Spirit of God work in you. Lord God, we pray that you'd help us. Help us to be people that are led by your Spirit and by your Word. That you would teach us and guide us. That you'd open our hearts and help us to walk away from sin, from worry, from fear, frustration, Lord. That we would trust you and you alone. And that we would be able to walk in the light of your hope to celebrate the grace of that you have shown to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. That we are forgiven and that we can rejoice in you and you alone. Help us then, oh God, to let your Spirit teach us, to speak to us, and that we would respond with humility, humbleness, that, that we would follow and do just as you lead us. We pray your blessing upon us, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we receive the offering, um, deacons, would you come forward? We're going to watch a, a quick video.